I know the the Emmys were recently, and uh, I want to get your thoughts on this because to me, Better Call Saul, and I'm not just saying this when I'm talking to you, but to me, it's one it's one of my favorite shows. Now, it was nominated for 53 Emmys, Better Call Saul. It didn't win any of them, which to me personally, I believe you guys were robbed. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts on that, and if it's something that doesn't even matter much to you, I want to just get your thoughts on the whole thing. Uh, well, you know, first of all, we're 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 uh, we're record holders. We, we have more Emmys without winning than any other show in the history of the Emmys. So yeah. that's kind of a, a notorious thing. You know, in the end, one, this sounds like a pablum and cliche, but it's true. It's great to be recognized and it's great to be invited. You know, for each season, we were nominated for Best Drama. That's rare air. And I know that because the first season we went, I saw all these other shows that were there. And seven years later, we're the only show that's still there after seven years. You know, you watch them come, you watch them go. Um what are you going to do about people not voting for you to be the best? I, I think with, with, with the nominations that happened early on, you know, they had just come off of giving breaking bad, everything, every known award to man. And I think there's a, a, a human nature thing of like, man, we gave these guys this stuff already. So about three or four years into it though, I thought we had maybe earned our own, particularly the performances of Jonathan Banks and Ray Seahorn and, and Bob Odenkirk. And so that's sort of disappointing when you get invited to the party and they don't pick you without a doubt. But in the end, you know, you're sitting there at the Emmys, which is crazy rare air. And they all of a sudden announce those categories and they put up, you know, the six best performances. And with each one you go, oh yeah, that's really good. Oh, he's really good too. Same thing with the shows. They put the shows up there. You're like, Oh, that's a really good show. You know what I mean? So it feels like it could be anybody's. Would it have been nice to have won something for the show? Absolutely. I think Ray Seahorn, if we really want to talk about it, was uh, criminally overlooked for the first uh, five seasons. I mean, she got two nominations there at the end, but I thought her work in particular was so extraordinary. Um, and, you know, you think it's great looking on the screen. I was there with a front row seat watching that go down. And, uh, just amazing. But I think what was really wonderful about this last Emmy was that we all showed up and it was a great reunion because the show had been over. It had broadcast and, and all that. And because of COVID, you know, our final season was weird filming. We couldn't hang out with one another like we had before and all of those things. It was really great to come together one more time and put on our pretty dresses and suits and wrap our arms around one another and, and say, good job. You know, it's, it's really great to be a part of it. So you know, yeah. and guess what? We made Emmy history, so I'll, I'll take that as the sidebar. Breaking Bad is considered one of the greatest shows of all time. When Better Call Saul first came out, fans were worried. They asked themselves, is this show going to live up to the hype? Will it even touch Breaking Bad? And as time went on, people started falling in love with this brilliant show, and some fans even argue that it's better than Breaking Bad. Even though we get to witness some of the same characters from Breaking Bad and it's in the same universe, the shows are completely different. And I asked Patrick Fabian his thoughts. I, I think you're spot on. It's like it's like a great closet of wardrobe and we're a shirt over here and they're a shirt over there. It is in the same universe, but they're different. There are different pieces of clothing. And you also can keep in mind that, you know, they had seven years to make Breaking Bad. And so by the time they went on break, doing Better Call Saul, they really had two things going for them. One, Breaking Bad was such a success. There was nobody overlooking anybody's shoulder for Vince and Peter to create what they wanted to with Saul. And that included, to your point, maybe a little less action and crime and a little more interior work on like Saul and Kim. I mean, let's face it. Saul is, is I hate to use the word, it is paced differently. It's a little slower than Breaking Bad. It just is, especially in the beginning seasons. It rewards viewers for being really patient and to be really observant. But Vince and Peter knew their audience at this point because Breaking mm -hmm. Bad also wasn't the kind of show that um, would do a lot of repetition to catch you up if you hadn't seen what's going on. They made you pay attention. They, they taught the audience to pay attention to everything that was going on because nothing was wasted. And I think, uh, you know, having that 800 pound gorilla of the success of Breaking Bad, uh, when we started off with Saul, both the creators and the audience alike were a bit like, what's going on? Yeah. Are you gonna tarn are you gonna tarnish breaking bad? And some people immediately sort of like they're like, oh, this isn't breaking bad. Uh, and they sort of walked away from it. But I think the wave of the fans stuck with it in the early years 
um, word got back out to those who maybe said, well, I don't like it to revisit it. And by the time they revisited it and caught up with it, I think, you know, things really steamroll in those final two seasons. And, and to your point with El Camino really satisfyingly helped sew up the world as created by those guys. And that's a rare thing to be able to do in television. Um, I was just excited to be poured into those beautiful suits and have them shoot me like a movie star. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I didn't see the, I see those frames when we go. Well, one of the great things is that, you know, for the, um, for the premieres, we always go to a, a movie theater and they put it up on the big screen. And that's when I really could see what the DP was doing. You know, all of a sudden you're like, oh, they're painting this for the big screen. It's incredible. And the fact that you're in a, a quick funny story. So Ray, yeah, Seahorn yeah. Comes, Ray Seahorn comes to me one time. Uh, this is early on in, in the first season. And she comes up to me and she says, now, Patrick, I'm not accusing you of being the kind of actor who's going to wait for the close-up to turn it on. However, she told the accuser me. Um, she said, I just did a scene where they framed it out in a master shot, and I was like this big in it with my back turned. They shot it like 10 times, and they said, got it, moving on. <laughs> and it was a reminder of like, you know, you always think myopically. The show's about Howard and his face. It's about, the, it's not. It's about the totality of it. And Vince and the DP and, and Peter and those directors, they knew that. And so when I would see the finished product, I would be like, oh, wow. First of all, there's a whole lot of crime in the show that I had no idea about. What are we doing on the desert? And then the second thing was the art of what they were painting and how they were painting it. It was just a privilege to be in the picture. For sure. And I, yeah, like I said, the show did a great job of not living in Breaking Bad shadow. Actually, I have a friend right here who wants to say hello. Look at this guy. I got, uh -oh, who's I got, a, I got, a, I got a Walter White. Uh, I don't know if you know what these are. They're called Bear Bricks. They're, I don't know. That. No. They're, <laughs> they're awesome, these things. I know I collected it. I'm like, you know what? Perfect to show you for the interview. But Oh my God, that's <laughs> but, great. Better Call Saul reminded me of The Sopranos, which is my favorite show of all time, when it came to the pacing. Even though there's crime in this show, at its core, Better Call Saul is a drama that's well layered. And if I had to give my thoughts on the whole Breaking Bad versus Better Call Saul debate, I'd probably say that I rooted for Saul more than Walt. Kim Wexer was also more likable than Skyler White. But more importantly, we got to see the backstory of some of the characters from Breaking Bad, like Saul, obviously, Mike, Gus and Hector, who can actually walk and talk. He was a badass. Rest in peace to Mark Marjolis. And on top of that, we got to witness new characters, like the crazy Lalo, or Nacho, who was the one who put Hector in the wheelchair, and of course, Howard Hamlin, who was purely misunderstood and ultimately a tragic character. You gotta give credit to Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould. I mean, I had no idea there was this much going on before Breaking Bad. It blows my mind. No, I mean, like, Vince and Peter, I mean, talk about that writer's room, uh, because they just finished Breaking Bad, and now they're just like, oh, we're going to roll the dice on this and see what's what. But those writers, I'm not, you know, speaking out of school, they've talked about this a lot of times. They didn't have anything plotted out. They didn't know. As a matter of fact, Nacho's a great example. So at one point, they're talking about what's going on, and they're just like, well, we have to, we have to have a character named Ignacio. And the writers are like, well, do we? And they're like, yes, because we named him. It's Saul's first entrance, right? Ignacio, not me, it's Ignacio. And you're like, oh, so who is he? So then the writers sit there and go like, who is Ignacio? What, who's Lalo? What is this? Yep. And, and then from there, they start going. And that's what I think the, the audience resonates with. The writers are so deliberate about not just sort of making something up because it fits. They make it up because it actually does fit, you know, and uh, it, it gives, you know, people ask me if they see none of them, what order they should watch them. And I think you're supposed to watch Breaking Bad first. And the reason is because if you watch Breaking Bad first, the enjoyment of Saul is so much more because you have foreknowledge. I mean, what other show can you watch where you know, you know, Gus's fate, you know, Mike's fate, right? Yeah. And yet when you're watching it and you also know, you, you also kind of know Saul's fate from Breaking Bad. Also, who's this Kim Wexer? Where's she? What's she doing? Right. And so you keep waiting for things to happen to them. 
And uh, I mean, talk about brilliant being able to get you interested in watching something where you know the outcome. And yet you keep thinking, is there an off ramp? Is there a world where Jimmy and Kim move to Santa Fe and have a couple of kids and get away from all this? And so yeah. it's that it's a slow motion car crash that you can't take your eyes off of. Yeah, I, it's so funny, brother, because because when I before when I was watching, I forgot what I, th I think it was season five. I, f I forgot what season it was. Uh, but when when Gus and Lalo have their whole interaction, when 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 uh, Gus kills Lalo, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's a point when Gus gets shot. I remember, right? And even then, I was on my toes, and I was like, "Wait, what?" I'm like, "But it's like I already know his fate doesn't happen there." And I'm like, "But still, I was on my toes." I'm like, "No, I'm like, I thought my my girlfriend and I were watching the show. Like, I'm like, no, like there's no way." And she's like, "I don't know what's going on right now. Why, why did he get shot? Like, what, what's gonna happen?" And then. And then it it just that's how they get you, right? So I don't know. It was great, in my opinion. Howard Hamlin is one of the greatest characters on this show. He went from being so hated to one of the most beloved characters on this show. He was also one of the most misunderstood characters from the beginning. He's seen taking the blame for others' bad actions. He willingly acts as the bad guy for Chuck, letting him pretend to be on Jimmy's side. But later on, Howard's true colors show, and we realize he's actually a great guy. He ended up paying Chuck out of pocket just to get rid of him. And even after Jimmy and Kim tried to ruin his life, he didn't seek revenge. The way he confronted them in plan and execution was in such a genuinely confused, why the hell are you doing this kind of way? So I asked Patrick Fabian his thoughts on Howard Hamlin's evolution in the show. I think Howard is ultimately a decent guy. I mean, and the writers every season gave like a little extra window into who he was, mm -hmm. which was great. Uh, you know, um, he is, we never see his dad. We never even talk about whether his dad is alive or dead. We assume his father is dead, right? So he got brought into the law firm. We know that he tells Kim, I wanted to put my own shingle out. So he didn't want to be where he was. So maybe he actually had, you know, he admires Kim. He was grooming Kim to put her name on the wall. He pays for her college education, right, to finish up. Um, he's actually a decent guy. He's trying his best to take care of Chuck, who we can admit is a genius of the law. Howard says it. Chuck acts like it. We all know that. So for me as an actor, I was like, oh, so maybe Howard feels that if Chuck wasn't there, he couldn't run the law firm, Right that there's the brains and here's the guy who goes to the golf course and gets all the stuff. So that was sort of my idea of like Howard never went out on his own. He relies on Chuck and then he finds himself doing sort of moral, morally duplicitous things to Jimmy in servicing Chuck and his ego. And it takes Chuck's death to, to, to make Howard go, wait a second, what's going on? What am I doing? I lose Kim. I've been an idiot to Jimmy and, 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 ha and then Chuck's death makes him go, and this is a guy who loves his Jaguars, his golf courses. He's a preening guy. There's no doubt about it. But he goes to therapy. He goes to therapy in a big way, something that Jimmy probably could have benefited by. And that great scene in the bathroom where Howard's disheveled, his tie's off. He's a wreck because he's going through something. And he offers the thing to Jimmy, like, you should go see somebody. And, of course, he doesn't take it up on him. Um, but Howard comes through that. Of course, this is why I love the writers. Howard comes through therapy, but unlike in a Hollywood fashion, he's the ther he's the guy who comes through therapy and then puts namaste on his license plate, yep. right? Yeah. So he's it's like, oh, Howard, you're almost there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but to your point, that scene then when Jimmy explodes on him, that was directed by Melissa Bernstein, by the way, one of the other executive producers. Um, that image is so perfect because at that point, Howard has come to a different point. He doesn't have to engage with that. And it, enra it enrages Jimmy. It enrages him because Jimmy didn't take therapy. Jimmy hasn't dealt with his demons. And you see that Howard's fine. He's locked in. He's done with him and he walks away. And Jimmy's left like a puppet going crazy. And then from then on, you know, uh, Howard is actually, you know, he's getting, he stuck his hand out to Jimmy. He tried to give him a job. He warns Kim again, but those two have just gone the wrong direction. And in the finale for Howard's storyline, after they humiliate him, the bowling balls, the hookers and everything. And then finally he gets his pants basically pulled down in his own office, humiliated, reputationally destroyed. Mm -hmm. They win. But when Howard comes back to their apartment, 
to let them know, you know, I know what's going on. I'm going to get you. He has come to a spot where he's like, that's all right. It, what he says is so true. The writers gave Howard and me such a gift to be able to come in and ask what I think the audience was wondering. Why are you doing this? Yes. Why are you doing this? What's why are you doing this? Is it because of this? Is it because of truck? The cornfield? Like what? Yeah. What possibly can think? And then Howard gets to, I think, speak to the audience as well, saying, like, you guys are morally bankrupt. This behavior, there's nothing fun about it. And I think that's a moment that the writers, um, the writers allow the audience to sort of uh, shake themselves out of to be like, right, who am I rooting for? Why am I rooting for these guys? Howard has a point, right? He really yeah. has a point. Oh, look at him. Oh my God. After we found out about his wife, oh, he's human just like me. Oh, yeah. things are really bad for him. Look at him. Howard's going to pick himself back up. Oh my gosh. He's laying it out. Doesn't matter how long he's going to get them back. And then the candle blows the second time. Oh, and the audience, and it, right. And that's the action. The audience goes, oh, what? Oh, shit. I forgot about. Oh, no. Yep, that was my reaction. Right? Yeah. You're like, oh, no. And they don't let it draw out. It's not like three minutes of monologues or blah, blah, blah. It's like 30 seconds. And what a, the, one of my favorite lines that they ever gave Howard was in that moment where he says, me? I just want to talk to my lawyers. And Howard all of a sudden is like, you know, doing um, doing a, a stand up stand up comedy. He's like, oh, yeah, you want some advice? You got to get better lawyers. Put up both. <laughs> and he's yeah. the only one. He's on an island of not knowing. And he finally has a bit of perception. And then it's too late. It's so sudden. It's so awful. And literally the consequences, the unintended consequences of Jimmy and Kim's actions are laid and made manifest laid at their feet uh, Boom. and then the credits roll and everybody screams at the television <laughs> oh you know, it caught me so off guard but that's what would actually ha happen in real life it wouldn't be this dragged out scene in real life you see a, a criminal like lalo and you're in his way because he's thinking in his head this guy gets out i'm done boom that's it that's how he lays him out but that whole death scene i read that that um ray is seen and bob Odenberg, they didn't know about that it was kept a secret for a while what was the whole story behind that Oh, well, you know what? Uh, in the beginning of the season, I got a call from Vince and, and Melissa and Peter Gould. And when, just as an actor note, when the three executive producers of your show call you before you begin filming the season, you're not sure if you want to pick up the phone. But at this point, I had a, I had a feeling. And they said, hey, uh, Vince said, hey, guess what? The writers found a really good thing for Howard. They're so excited. It brings the two worlds together. And I said, and? He goes, and I just wanted to let you know that you're going to be able to go on vacation a little bit earlier this season than usual. And I was like, okay, don't tell me how, don't tell me when. And, and so every week I would get uh, the episodes and read through. And then I started convincing myself that maybe it wasn't going to happen, that they changed their mind. And I got that episode seven. Um, and to your point, Ray and I would, Ray, Bob, and I lived together, and we would constantly say to one another, do you know what's going to happen to your character? Has anybody told you anything? And I would say, nope, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I got really good at saying that, because after Vince told me that, he said, he said, you know, forget it. Forget that we said anything. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell anybody. I got real good over six seasons of Saul talking about Saul without talking about any of it. You know what I mean? Yep. So then we're doing the seasons. We're shooting and da 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 and just like we normally do. We get an episode. We read it. So Ray reads episode seven and she gets to the end and she calls up Peter and Vince and she goes, Oh my God, did you guys tell Patrick? Have you told him yet? And Vince is like, Oh yeah, hell we told him like five months ago. And she called me. She was like, what? You asshole. You didn't tell me. Yet. <laughs> That's too funny. You know, I, mean, I, I didn't want her to know. And I also think even when I was reading the script, I, I was like, Oh, look at Howard. He's doing all this stuff. Chatty Howard. He's giving him a lot of scenes. This is, it's more than I ever did in the whole, whole show, right? Yeah. Where in my in my naive actor mind, I'm thinking, as I'm going through the script, I'm like, well, there's not many pages left for anything to happen. This is amazing. This is amazing. So again, it it, it plays out on the screen just like it reads. Mm -hmm. Bottom of the page, candle blows again. Huh? Top of the page, Lalo enters. Half a page later, end of show. And you're like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, mind like wow. So I put that down. I'm like, oh wow, that's it. That's the end. There it is, literally in black and white. Crazy. 
end of you know 10 years of work basically yeah no but but you talked about a good point about yeah how the crime world meets like i guess the real world right where how, how and howard is that has no idea he's on this island so oblivious like in his mind right but um well, it, could be you. it could be you i think that's the, the power the power is nobody yeah. saw it coming because howard's not in the game and it's wrong it's literally wrong place wrong time and that could be anybody because you adam you know as far as i know you're not in the game either right how do you, you know, know that? I'm joking, I'm joking. I know, I know. I mean, you look I'm like kidding. You might be. I'm totally kidding. Yeah, yeah. But you know what I mean. And then, yeah. and most people aren't lawyers, so you're watching this at a bit of a distance. And then all of a sudden, that happens. You're like, oh, that could be me. That's how dangerous this all is. To your point, Lalo comes in, and I'm just in the way. No, no hesitation. No, because yeah, yeah, he, yeah, you're in his way. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, people are like, oh. I like tower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, and then and then you're saying to them, "Too late, that's it." But yeah, even yeah. when you guys, even when you and Lalo get buried, when I was watching, I was trying to put in my head like the the symbolism behind that, and I was trying to like wrap my head around it because it was very complex. But I knew there was some symbolic aspects to it. My interpretation was like, okay, you and Lalo getting buried, it's like the good and the bad. It's almost like Jimmy or Saul's moral compass getting buried the good and the bad and now he's left a shell of a man that's how i interpret it first it's also the other one i interpreted of how that's the same ground that walt and jesse ultimately cook on in breaking bad which okay. ultimately if you think about it i know jesse pinkman didn't die but he died in a metaphorical sense where he kind of just lost his way. He lost who he ultimately was and he lost everything. And I kind of think that them working on the deaths of Lalo and how, um, yeah, Lalo and Howard, it's almost like it, it's, it's like a red hearing, I guess is the right word where something bad uh -huh. can happen later on. So I don't know if that's the right interpretations, but that's kind of just what I thought of it. I knew there was something to it. Well, I can tell you that Vincent Peter would be very excited that you uh, that you uh, put all that thought into it. I don't know if they did. I can't speak for them, but I love. Yeah. I've often thought about it's almost like the yin and the yang of Howard and and Lalo being put in there, and it's so brutal. It's so brutal to have them both just disposed of and buried under. And again, that goes back to the idea: if you've seen Breaking Bad, then all of a sudden you're like, "Oh shit, they've been in the super lab the entire time." I mean, there's your bar bet. Who from Breaking Bad ends up in Better Call Saul? Well, Lalo and uh, and I mean, Howard. Lalo and Howard, they're right there. They're but, right uh, there, and and when you watch the show after, you go, "Are they stepping on them right now? What's going on?" <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's kind of brilliant. When we did the scene, you know, I, I'm I'm dead a little longer than uh, than Lalo, and so our beautiful hair and makeup division made sure that I looked like I was decomposing a little bit longer. And that's always weird when you're on set and you're you're dead. Yeah. So, yeah. Then, so then Tony and I jump down into the uh, into the pit, and I remember Vince standing over us, going, "Well, I don't know if the fans are going to forgive me for this one." <laughs> <laughs> well, well, at the end of the day, you know, I think if they didn't do it, you kind of have to think too, like what what else would they have done, right? It's kind of like one of those things where you don't want it to happen, but you know it serves the story, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. but uh, one of the other things I wanted to touch upon was really cool. The boxing match between Howard and Saul. That was one of my favorite things because that's like Howard out of his element. If you think about it, right. It's kind of like you want to picture Howard doing that, but it's kind of funny and it's kind of cool, but um, it was a pretty intense moment. I would say, even though it was filmed in a very lighthearted way and had like, I think it had like some not funny music, but it had like some lighthearted music to it. And it kind of it was kind of like that comic relief, but I guess the I the message behind that was deeper than just the surface level aspect of oh they're boxing in a in a ring, uh, and and the quote when you tell Saul at the end you mistaken my kindness for weakness that was to me when I heard that I go okay, Howard means business, but at the same time he's 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 letting Jimmy know or Saul know I I've had enough of this I want this to end. And I hope this puts a stop to it, but he knows Howard in his mind. He's looking at Saul on the ground like, you were defeated right now, and you're still going to come back to me. So it, it's not right. Like, and that's kind of no, how I No, absolutely. And the boxing thing, you're right. You're sort of like, well, this is kind of ridiculous. And um, and yet it is and it isn't because it's so base. Boxing is so base. It seems so non-Howard, right? You're like, oh, Howard's not a boxer. And when we were doing it, we decided that, well, Howard wouldn't, do anything that he didn't have the advantage on and so I, I i took it as like 
Howard read in like a men's magazine that boxing and speed training was really good for your cardiovascular. And so he decided, <laughs> so he hired like the best trainer and the best thing, and he has all the right gear, right? And so he did it. Uh, he did it long enough to fancy himself a good boxer. Um, and he's certainly a better boxer than, than Jimmy. And Jimmy's, you know, way out of shape. But we're both gassed because boxing, I don't know if you've ever done it. You, it it's, it's really about uh, conditioning for your breathing. Oh, you get sure. it so, so fast. And so Bob's, um, Bob's point was that we should be like sort of flailing around. And this is the only time that I ever pulled rank on Bob if there is such a thing. Because Bob had just come off of doing Nobody, the the action movie, where yeah, he, yeah, yeah, where he kicks ass. He's he's fit and lean and doing all this, and he keeps saying uh, to the director, he's just like, yeah, we we both should be like swinging and missing and stuff like that. And I let Bob go off for a second. I said, well, hang on a second. First of all, in the script, it doesn't say anything about Howard being out of shape. And I said, and second of all, I know it really bums you out because you're number one on the call sheet. But in the end, Howard knocks you out. So <laughs> that's the way it's got to look, is what I'm saying. So he giggled. He goes, okay, okay. But we both agreed that, that us getting gassed made sense for the amount of time that we were up in the ring. But, you know, we were sitting there in that ring. They made that in the middle of a, a warehouse in downtown Albuquerque. And it's one of those movie magic moments where, you know, of course, it looks like a movie. It's it's a single lit ring in the middle of this giant warehouse. It's gorgeous. They lit it so nicely. And I'm standing there with Bob, and they've strapped us up with our boxing gloves. And he just giggled, and he looked around, and he goes, is this crazy? Two middle-aged guys who don't know how to box are boxing now and get paid for it on camera. And I just laughed, and I was like, what good fortune to be here, and what good fortune to be with Bob. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And even how like Luis Moncada trained, uh, I don't know if he just trained oh, you, yeah. both you guys, but yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Like uh, just to see that too. Another aspect of the crime world in the real world there. Eh? Oh yeah. And Luis <laughs> was really encouraging, even though I knew I was, you know, I was terrible. I'd never boxed before, but he was really encouraging. He was a yeah. great trainer in that he didn't dwell on what I was doing wrong. He was encouraging and trying to grow the small things that I could do right. And in the end, you'd watch him and, like, you know, I had a body double as well, as did Bob, for some of the things. Um, but when I saw the final cut, most all of it's us, which is great, which is yeah. really fun. I'm always curious if Vince Gilligan will ever do another spinoff show in the Breaking Bad universe. Recently, Giancarlo Esposito stated in an online interview that he would love a Gustavo Frank spinoff show. And there's something about Mike. I mean, he's so mysterious and you wonder what his backstory is. I was curious to get Patrick Fabian's thoughts on any spinoff show ideas. Well, I can't get enough of Kim Wexler is really the truth. I would love to see, I'd love to see Ray Seahorn do something with that. I have a feeling though, again, I don't know any inside knowledge. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling with the way that they wrapped up Saul and they did already do El Camino that we sort of have that world set for a while i don't know i think vince gave an interview actually just a while ago and they asked him about it. he goes well i don't think we're going to be visiting that again i think i think we're all good i'm doing some new things and on all that sort of thing and then he paused he goes well, of course if you don't like the new things you never know <laughs> so uh you never know yeah well even john carlo esposito there was a thing he said he wanted to do a gus spinoff show you know there's ways to do it but i mean yeah there's like everybody there's gus even mike i would love to see mike see because mike what is interesting about his character yeah. But his son, right? He feels he has that guilt with his son about his son dying. And I feel like if we were to go back and see how that would happen, because I think after that point, Mike truly changed. We never get to see when his son dies and stuff. But like, I think after that, really kind of set him off. So I really would like to see that. Or even when he talks about in the final episode, he goes, you know, uh, Saul, oh, if you had a time machine, what would you do? He's like, uh, 1984, I think it was 1984, whatever the year he yeah. said, he goes, oh, I would. Uh, my first bribe, you know, and I, and you could tell it's like, Mike, it's like, he didn't want it. He didn't want to be a part of that. Probably he probably just did it because he made some bad decisions. Like most people do yeah. got too suckered in and it had tragic consequences. His son, he, Mike ended up dying because he dealt with Walter and stuff. So one of those things where I feel like you could, you could do so much, but it also the thing where you got to be careful. Cause if you do too much, it leaves that that I guess I, I'm not sure if the right word, the ambiguity of it. Like you, 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 you can't let the audience think for themselves after, because if it's all in your face, you kind of go, okay, now there's not left 
for any imagination. Yeah, and I think they like to leave room for imagination. Look, you know, Breaking Bad was such a, 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 a wonderful surprise hit to begin with. And then it gave them the ability to make Saul, which was also a surprise that you'd go back to the well and, and it really fleshed it out. And and I think as uh, writers and directors, they may feel like, you know, that was a once in a lifetime. What a great what a great thing we had done. Uh, let's not try and go back and and monkey with any more of it. You know, I'm sure Sony and AMC would have loved 10 seasons of Better Call Saul. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I'm I also glad they, I'm, I'm glad they wrapped it up when they did. I think it was probably just the right, right, the right moment. For sure, absolutely. And you know, be, one more thing before we end off, I just want to do something really funny. I have uh, something that I want to show you. One sec. Uh oh, <laughs> you're, you're gonna love this, by the way. And this is I. This happened obviously before I knew about this interview. Before I even knew about this fun fact. So you're gonna love this. I really loved your role as Mr. Belding in Say by, Say by the Bell of the College Years. <laughs> well, I was Professor Lasky. No, it's um, a it's a joke because I know because I know everyone always says that for some reason, which I don't see. Well, the they do because, you know because because for anybody who's like twenty, they're like, well, it's a it's an old guy. It's a guy over forty, right, with a forehead. <laughs> but, but you know, but you know what's funny. And I'm, it's, I'm saying this like in, a, in the, mo the um, you're the, you're a really handsome guy. So it's like when they when they compare you to that guy, not that they bad oh, up with him, but like it's like, what? And, and, and he's like, a wonderful guy, but people come up to me all the time and do me. They they like Mr. Belding. I'm like, oh no. That's why I brought it up because I'm like I heard you hate when people say. So I wanted to bring that up, but <laughs> but at least you can say that you got to kiss Kelly Kapowski. But 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 Patrick, let me ask you something. Did you ever ride a moped with Kelly Kapowski? Adam, how did you manage that? Oh so my God. I have a good, I have a good friend. Yeah, you gotta check this out. So I, I have a good friend. You gotta check him out on Instagram. He goes by Sir Collect a lot. He makes one on one figurines, and I had him on my show for an interview a few years ago, and he made my own figurine. And I, I, I didn't even tell him about Kelly Kapowski. I, I just said, look, like I love Saved by the Bell. I love nineties. I'm an old soul and stuff. I said, like, just you do whatever you think is best. He put me on a moped with her. My face is right there, and I had to bring that up because I'm like. Oh, he he kissed her in the show, but I got to ride a moped. You got to ride the moped with her, mate. You win. <laughs> I think you win. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I want to show that, but uh, yeah, but no, listen, Patrick. I wanted to say thanks for coming on today. Uh, what a pleasure talking to you, me and you face to face. Um, I wish we do these things in person more, but you know, obviously, like me being in Toronto, it'd be hard to do these things. But yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, we can stay in touch. I have your Instagram, and yeah, just thanks again for everything. Perfect. Thanks, brother. Take care. Take care, man. See you.